Thank you so much for joining us today for the message. As always, I wanna encourage you to make sure that you are planted in a local church um, wherever you live so that you are able to serve and worship together with others. But we do pray that our church is a great resource to you and many others. And if our church has been a blessing to you, I would encourage you to join us in financially giving so that we can continue to provide resources just like today's message, as well as many other things abroad. Thank you again. God bless. So this morning, what we look at is Abraham. He has another meeting with God, and Sarah is, is of the main interest, if you will, of this meeting, even though she never, as we're going to see in a moment, comes out of the tent. She's at the door or the flap of the tent, but she never comes out. But yet this conversation in chapter 18 is specifically for, for her. And so we found that God has called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans. He has told him not where he's going to go, but that he is to leave his family, to leave everything that he knows, leave the land he knows, leave the city. I mean, because that's a metropolis, right? I mean, there's a lot of security there. There's a lot of money to be made to go to a land that... He doesn't know where. He doesn't say what land. We don't even see the name of the land until we're getting further into Genesis 15 and then in 17. And so he tells him to leave. He's faithful to do so. Uh, he promises him in Genesis 12 to become what? A great nation. God makes him great promises um, if he's willing to leave, if he's willing to go, that he will be a father of a multitude. And he's 75, by the way, when he's leaving. Um, I don't know about y'all, but we talked about this again weeks ago is that a lot of us have trouble with change, period, no matter how old you are, but to be 75 and to be told, leave it all and go somewhere that you don't even know where is definitely a test right off the bat of your, of your faith. God is faithful to him over these 25 years where we find Abraham now, chapter 21 specifically, he's 100 years old. Sarah is now 90 years old. 25 years have passed. Abraham has made... Sarah as well, they have made mistakes along the way, but God has been faithful. Amen? Let's start the morning with an amen right there. Not, not amen to the, the sin, like that's not what we're amening, but we are amening the fact that God is, God disciplines us because he loves us and he wants us to share in his holiness, Hebrews 12, but he is faithful and grants us every single day that you wake up, that is the mercy of God shining forth on your life, whether it's pouring down rain or whether it's the sun coming through, blazing into your own home life car, window, whatever it may be. And today we talk about Sarah and Abraham being visited by the Lord. So let's read the text, 18.1. It says, And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, and he sat at the, front, at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there were three men standing in, the front, in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. And he said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, while I bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on. Since you have come to your servant, so they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man, and he prepared it quickly. And then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At that point in time, at the, at the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. Genesis 21 verse 1. The Lord visited Sarah as he said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time in which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who was born to him, born to Sarah, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. 
Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born to him, and Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age? And that is the word of the Lord this morning. I just want to talk through the text for a moment before we get into the points, and that's in your worship, God. Hopefully you got one of those at the door. Uh, that's why we left lines before we get into the points so that you would be able to kind of write things, jot things down because this is one of those texts that it's broad, but as always, we're gonna narrow down into what we're gonna focus on. Abraham has finished all of his work for the day, right? He's at, he's at the flap of the tent. Uh, it says the door of the tent, but I mean a tent typically is not like a hard structure, so most likely it's, it's the flap of the tent is down and all of the morning labor is done, but it's the heat of the day and so he's probably taking... I'm, I'm reading him the lines here, but it's most likely true. He's probably taking a siesta. He's probably resting his eyes um, because it's hot. If any of y'all remember last summer or have been alive for any of the summers in Louisiana, but especially like last summer or 2011, that was a very, very hot summer. I don't know if y'all remember that, but a ton of trees, oak, te- oak trees specifically died that summer because of lack of water and immense heat. So if you can think again, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel is a very hot and arid country. Um, if you go there specifically in the summertime. And so I could easily see him saying, I've done my work, now I'm going to take a rest. And if you notice what happens here, look at verse one. It says, and the Lord appeared to him. Okay, this is the author giving us some inside information. It, It doesn't mean that Abraham knew right off the bat because when he looked up, he suddenly saw that there were what, three, three men. There was no clue, no indication. A lot of pictures that you see that have been drawn, you know, archaic pictures have like halos over the head or angels, you know, being entertained underwear. Well, he didn't know who they were right off the bat is what I'm leaning towards. Now, what they ended up saying later on would definitely have clued him in, of course, as to who they were. But right off the bat, he does not know who this is that has come to him. And some of you say, well, hold on. He, he ran to them, Josh. I mean, he, he bowed to the ground. I mean, he, he served them like nobody's business, right? I mean, how in the world would you say, okay, Abraham was a godly man, a righteous man, specifically in that culture, in that day and time, as it sh- should be today. It's just not. But as it is today and should be today for Christians, hospitality was absolutely an honor, to welcome in guests, anyone who came in your area because it was a nomadic society and therefore if they were traveling through, it was an honor for you to serve them, to love them, to feed them, to provide for them. And so what he offers them is basically, hey, let me get you some water to wash your feet. Let me get you some bread so you can snack on something while you're here and then you can go on your way. What he offered them was a snack. What he provided them with on the other hand was a feast and that's exactly, by the way, church, That's exactly how our lives should be. Our life should be the giving of ourselves to others, the abundance and overflow. They expect one thing, but they get something, not worse, but something better. Something better is another way for us to shine Christ's light. Why were you so kind to me? Why were you generous to me? Why did you pull over on the side of the road? You don't know me. Well, I I saw that you, your car, you were having trouble. I, I didn't see... I saw you, but I didn't see a husband or a male outside, and I saw that your tire was flat, so I mean, I want to help you. Do do you want help? And and the thing is, I'm just giving examples, but like, we should have an overflow of generosity towards people, which would then cause them to say, why are you treating me so well? So again, his hospitality is in contrast, we're not reading Genesis 19 right now, but read Genesis 19 later, and you see how the men of Sodom treated these men, angels as we know, but they appeared to be men and saw how they treated them. They tried to rape them and murder them. But yet there's a lot who doesn't go quite over the top as Abraham does, but yet he's welcoming them in, providing for them, arguing to the point that you can't stay in the town square. You've got to stay in my house, in my protection. Notice what he's saying right here. He says, quickly, look, he jumps up in verse 2 and he ran. He's 99 years old, by the way. Soak it in, 99 years old. We got kids today who are 20 that can't run, okay? 99 years old, and he runs to them. Verse six, he tells Sarah, he quickly goes to Sarah, and it says, quick, do this. He ran himself to the herd 
and got a young calf that is in right good condition. Meat's going to be tender, right? He offered breadsticks, and he offered him in the case of filet mignon, right? He, he said, I'll give you breadsticks, but I'm going to bring you some filet mignon. Like, this is Nick and Sam's. If you've ever been to Houston, it's a really nice restaurant or local to John's or whatever your place is. I don't know what you like to go to, but it's like he offered them Wendy's but brought them to John's, if that makes any sense at all in your mind. He told them, I'm going to give you a little something, and came back with a lot of something, and he did it in a hurry. Every single part there, verse 6 and verse 7 as well. And here's where we go. Suddenly, though, he's there, and he's not even eating with them, by the way. Sarah's not there. She's in the tent. He's not eating with them, standing behind them, standing beside them. He's waiting on them. Again, let this picture just sit in just a little bit. Still doesn't know who they are until they say what? Unprompted, where is Sarah, your wife? Now, I've never seen you before. I've never met you before. How did you know my wife's name? You haven't stalked me on social media because social media doesn't exist. You don't know my wife, right? You, you don't know her name. So, again, Sarah, I would imagine ears popped up a little bit. Abraham's like, okay, who's this? Now, I want you to think about something. They weren't supposed to know her name, but why did they say her name? Because they wanted to garner her attention. When the Lord said in the garden in Genesis 3, Adam, where are you? It wasn't a question of locality. It was a question of, I want your attention. When he said to Cain in chapter 4 of Genesis, he wasn't asking like, I don't know where your brother's at. Like he knew that he had murdered his brother. He said, where is your brother? It was a garnering of attention. When he says, Sarah, where is your wife Sarah at? He's saying, Hey, Sarah, I want you to listen in to what's about to be said to you. This morning, God's calling your name, no doubt about it. The Holy Spirit is speaking to each of us, specifically those who are followers of Christ, saying, would you just listen in just for a moment and hear the words that I would be speaking to you through his inspired word. See, the question was not where is she at. They knew where she was at. The question was, I want you to listen So if he wasn't sure about the divine nature, he's about to be sure. I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a child. Only the Lord had ever said anything to them like that, okay? Only the Lord had ever said anything remotely like that. Remember, they were called out when they're 75. When you're 75, you're not asking someone, hey, you thinking about having kids? Like, people would look at you like you're absolutely insane, like, What do you mean I'm thinking about having kids? Yeah, I thought about having kids for the last 40 years, but obviously I didn't, you jerk. You know what I'm saying? Like, as men, I know we've learned this lesson. I don't even ask people if they're pregnant. Like, I can know that you are 39 weeks pregnant, and I will not ask you. I just, I know what happens to people, right? And some of you are, like, not laughing, and it's true. Like, you do not, I just don't do it. I'm like, if they'll say that they're pregnant, I'm like, congratulations. When do you do? I'll do it like that, but I'm never going to ask because you get in trouble. If you're asking someone who's 75 years old, or in her case, she's 65 when he's called, you thinking about having kids? No. No, I'm not thinking about having kids. I'm 65 years old. I'm thinking about retirement, okay? That's what I'm thinking about. So when, when she hears this, she hears this with disbelief. And obviously in chapter 17, Abraham hasn't relayed the message to Sarah because in chapter 17, the Lord makes it very clear that Sarah's going to have a child. And he's over here, what about Ishmael? And the Lord says, I'll make Ishmael somebody, but he's not the child of the promise. Your wife Sarah is going to have a child. He obviously didn't say anything because the way that she responds to this subconsciously, she never talks out loud, by the way. Notice, she's not talking out loud. She's not laughing out loud either. She's just internally, this is a... This is a monologue taking place internally with her. This is not what she was expecting to hear. She did not, she did what any 90 year old would do. (laughs) Pregnant, this time next year, at 90. I mean, what would you do? You'd laugh. You, You would absolutely think that somebody was crazy for saying something like that. My granny just turned 99, like this, this month, like recently turned 99, and she's still active, right? She still drives. She still gets her hair done like every, uh, every Friday. And I mean, she's very active. But if I told my granny when we had our fish fry like a week ago, it's like, granny, this time next year, you're going to be having a kid. Like she would look at me like I was absolutely insane because humanly speaking, it's impossible. Can you say it with me? Say impossible. That was so weak. Impossible. That is not 
even remotely happening. Look what she says in verse 11. Look in your Bible. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. She's post-menopause. Like there, there are no eggs to be fertilized. Like there's nothing happening. She was barren when she should have been able to have kids. If she was barren then, how in the world is she going to have kids? It's, it's not going to happen. And what happens? She laughs internally and the Lord says, why did you laugh? This is like a slight rebuke for sure, but this is like, I don't know how else to read it other than just like, what are you laughing for? Because it's like, humanly speaking, you're like, that's just, it's not possible, it's not going to happen. Is anything too hard for the Lord? That's a question for us this morning. She was afraid and she denied laughing and lying is a sin, but lying to God just straight dumb, right? I mean, just like when you start to get a realization, like God already knows what you're thinking. God already knows what you're doing. God already knows what you're going through. Like sometimes we just catch ourselves and we're like, oh, I'm in a jam or oh, I'm a people pleaser. And therefore I lie about something. It may be not a big lie, but it's still a lie. But lying to God doesn't make any sense because he sees you and he, he knows you. And in Sarah's story, this is where we pick up our points I believe we can see our own story being played out. And so point number one this morning is our hopelessness, right? Sarah was hopeless, and we, apart from Christ, are hopeless. So our, hopeless, our hopelessness is the first point that we're talking about. When Sarah hears about the child, she's what? She's obviously shocked by the monologue going on in her head. She's laughing to herself. And obviously, as we mentioned, Abraham didn't say anything to her. And I get it. I, I get it. I mean... We have families inside of our church and, and over, some of them right now, possibly, but definitely ones that I've been aware of that they've been trying to have children and trying to have children and they have not been able to have children. And it's not because they don't love the Lord. It's not because they haven't been praying and seeking and asking. It's not because they haven't been trying. And so I, I can only imagine with Sarah being as old as she is and Abraham hearing this vision in chapter 17 and he's 99 years old then from the Lord, right? This is a small span between chapter 17 and chapter 18 and all the way actually to chapter 21, small span of time. Like I could see where he, I don't want to bring that up, Lord. I don't want to, I don't want to tell her. It's not that I don't want to tell her for good news. She's been, she's been let down so many times. I mean, think how many times, even at 75 and 65, which is when they were told you will have a child and yet they've had no child, that they tried to have a child. They tried to conceive a child. They, they tried to pursue having a child and finally they got exhausted and she said, take Hagar. Like, just put it in your mind. Don't just read the text. Like, let it soak in. Put some flesh on the text, right? I don't want to crush her again. And here's the thing too. I don't want to strain my marriage any more than it's been strained. The problem we read too many times in scripture is we think everybody in the Bible is like 10 foot tall and floating three foot off the ground. We, we put everybody with a halo as though they don't have flesh and blood, as though they're not tempted like we're tempted. As they're, they're not anxious like we're anxious, as though they don't get depressed like we get depressed and get down sometimes. Like they don't get despondent like we get despondent. Like they're not like us. And the answer is, with the Bible, they are human. She was furious with Abraham, even though it was her idea to sleep with Hagar and have a son and as soon as she got pregnant, Hagar looked at her with disdain. Furious. Hagar and Ishmael are still in the picture. Ishmael is getting older. Hagar's still there and is young and fruitful. Sarah is old and barren. Come on. Ladies specifically, come on. Like, think through this. I'm not saying that I know their marriage was in bad shape. I'm just saying that is friction. That is tension. That's not good. Why would I want to bring that up again? Why would I want to bring up something that would cause her to be hurt again? See, they weren't living in some fairy tale. They were living real life. And just like we are now living real life, real sin in our life, real failures at times in our lives, real hopelessness in our lives. I want you to read with me on the screen in your worship God as well. Ephesians 2, 11 through 14, it says, therefore, I want you to remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. She was far from hope, but now she's what? God is giving her hope. God is giving what he has promised. We were far from the Lord, but now we've been what? Brought near by the blood of Jesus. You were separated from Christ. People all the time saying, well, I was, I've always loved Jesus. No, you have not. No, you have not. We are at enmity with the Lord until we come to repentance and faith. You are not at peace with God. They can say whatever they want at your funeral, but if there is not repentance and faith, that does not determine whatever they try to say about you at the funeral. Like, you could have lived a quote-unquote from a humanly speaking perspective, a good life, but no one is righteous. No, not one. No one is good. We were, you were, I was, separated from Christ, alienated from the people of God, strangers of the covenant, hopeless and without God in the world. Remember where you come from. Remember where you come from so you can properly have gratitude. Think about 25 years of, long, longer than that, but 25 years of the promise and longing for it. And then we get to chapter 21. And she's just like, I can't help but laugh. She starts out with laughing in what? Disbelief. She ends up laughing with absolute gratitude. Think about where God has brought you from. Think about the small incremental steps of sanctification where God is bringing you, working out all of that wickedness, working out all of the sin in our life. Like God, I mean, praise the Lord for the leaps and bounds, right? Praise the Lord for the time when you were addicted to some type of drug and the Lord miraculously healed you. But do not let your story be diminished because God is walking you through phases where you dealt with pride and no one could see it and everybody was boasting about how great you were. But no, no, no. Thank the Lord that he's working out every single ounce of sin in your life. Remember where you come from so that you can be grateful for where you are and where you're going. Don't judge artwork by an unfinished product. The master is still at work. Give him praise and honor and thanks. John Newton, I I love this quote. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Remember where you come from so that when you think about where you're going, your heart delights in the presence of God. He says, you were, but now you have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. He himself is our peace. Secondly, here is our unbelief. So our hopelessness, we were hopeless like Sarah. But, but we also deal with, dealt with, and deal with unbelief, areas where our faith needs to, to grow Genesis 18, 11, I want to read this again. Now Abraham and Sarah were old. They were advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. About this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. She's in what? Shocked. Disbelief. Befuddled. We use that word often, right? I want you to flesh it out again. This text blows my mind. We read the, we read the Bible, I think, too quickly, or at least I do at times, and really kind of miss stuff. 90 years old and pregnant. Work with me, church. Work with me here. 90 years old and pregnant. For any of you who are just pregnant or are pregnant or can remember back to when you were pregnant, just want you to just think through because I read the 40 to 42 weeks basically of an average pregnancy, some of which I'm not going to express. I just want to talk about some of the things that we can all agree on in the sense that this is kind of happening. 90 years old and morning sickness. Come on. Some of y'all didn't deal with that, but some of y'all for sure did every morning. Whatever was there, it went out. 
morning sickness at 90. At 90, you have enough trouble getting out of the bed, much less being sick when you get out of the bed. Mood swings because of fluctuations in your hormones. You're not laughing yet. Tired. First trimester. Tired. Like, you're 90 years old. You're already tired. I mean, I don't know about you, but right at 40 years old, the middle of the day seems like a great time to to take a short nap. At 90 years old, and you're pregnant, like, can you fathom? What do you sleep, 24-7? Get someone to feed you in the middle of the day, right? I mean, I I don't know what happens here. Food cravings. Abraham. What, Sarah? It's the middle of the night. Get up. Go to the 7-Eleven. <laughs> you know, there's no 7-Eleven to go to. The craving. You, so here's the deal. Like, you got Sarah. She's 10 foot tall. You got Sarah. She's floating off the ground. You got Sarah. The Lord didn't give her any morning sickness. It doesn't say that. Well, the Lord surely wouldn't do that. Have you ever read the Bible? Like, it blows my mind, the biblical ignorance. And we're one of those churches that says you can't be biblically ignorant here. Like, we want to help you. We, we, we want to help you know the Word of God. Like, read the Bible. He's unpredictable. But very likely, morning sickness, mood swings, tired, food cravings, heartburn. That was like a heart attack. At 90, you're like, it is a heart attack. It's done. <laughs> Cramps. <laughs> Keep walking with me. I'm telling you, you're like, stop doing this, Josh. You're just messing up my entire picture of Sarah floating, okay? Swollen feet and swollen ankles. (laughs) Paint my toenails, Abraham. I can't reach them anymore. (laughs) Come on now, were you not there? Was that not you as a husband? And you didn't paint the toenails, you painted the whole foot. (laughs) You, You missed the whole thing, right? Like, think about this for a moment. Back pain because the stomach begins to pull and your spine comes forward. Like, Some of us already have back pain. It doesn't have anything to do with being pregnant. Okay. Frequent urination because you're getting pressed on on your bladder. Some of y'all don't want to laugh and you're just like, that just comes with age too. (laughs) Forgetfulness that comes with age. But hey, during pregnancy, it's actually shown that it increases. So if you're already a forgetful person, but take 90-year-old Sarah and then add to the very fact that she's forgetting maybe even more. Shortness of breath, many contractions, her water breaking, finally having a baby. You thought you were going to die when you had a baby. No epidural to give. There is no epidural to give. Okay? 90 years old, you're just like, this is miraculous. Miraculous that she gets pregnant. Miraculous that she's able to have the baby. Miraculous that she doesn't die, which was not part of the picture. Like, God didn't say for sure that she wasn't going to die. He said, there's going to be a child from you, right, Isaac? But, I mean, even then, the reason they wait eight days typically is because the mortality rate was so high. I mean, you have to figure out the validity of the child. Is the child actually healthy enough to survive? I mean, come on now. Like, you got to think through all of this stuff. And that's why she's able to say with such great laughter, initially the laughter of unbelief, which led, though, when she had the promised, fulfilled church. Go, go with me past the baby now. The promise fulfilled. She laughs with absolute joy. She laughs and just is absolutely blown away. She's thinking in her mind, how could this be possible? She's thinking in her mind, how or who am I to experience such a great blessing? What is her own words for herself? I'm worn out. I'm worn out. You know what that means? Like, that's literally for a garment that has been overly used to the point that it is shriveled up. Like, another version, another translation says, I'm shriveled up in Abraham's old. Am I supposed to experience the pleasure, pleasure period, and pleasure having a child? Like, is that even... It's not even in my vocabulary anymore. That's not even something I'm looking for anymore. I'm just trying to make it from A to B. Like, I'm not even thinking about that anymore. Abraham's too old, and I'm too old. I should be discarded. I should be thrown away like an old blanket. Here we are. We have similar thoughts, do we not? How could God save someone like me? How could God use someone like me after all I've done? After all I've been through, after all of my failures, after time and time again, I told God, God, if you will only save me, if you will only take care of this situation, I'll, I'll never do it again. 
and most likely we did it again. How could God bring beauty from the ashes I call my life? From the brokenness that I call my life? I want to say something this morning as we move on to the third point, that God delights in using. God delights in using the most unlikely people who know that it was not because of them, but only because of God. God loves to use people who cannot and will not take credit for what he does in their lives. Y'all follow me this morning? It is not about how great you are, how wonderful you are, about how wise you are. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, don't boast about how smart you are. Let the wise man not boast about how smart they are. Let the powerful man not boast about how strong they are. Let the rich man not boast about how rich they are. Rather, if you want to boast about anything, ever, boast that you know the Lord and that he loves righteousness. God loves using the most likely. And the question is, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything? Is there anything too hard? In Sarah's circumstances, it it didn't look possible. Is there anything too hard? The same phrase is used in Jeremiah 32 when they're about to go into captivity and the Lord says, buy some property. And Jeremiah's like, are you crazy? Like the whole land is about to be taken over by the Babylonians. We're under siege. People are like dying of hunger. You want me to buy land from my cousin? Read Jeremiah 32. It's wild. And the Lord says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Which is another way of saying, you're buying it and in your lifetime you won't see it But Israel's coming back to the land. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The powerful work of God in creation, salvation, resurrection, and the new creation all seem impossible until we realize who's what? Who's in control? Third and close here. Our laughter and joy. So not only we start with our hopelessness and we we deal with our unbelief, but then we also go, we move from that negative, that dark side to then the bright side of our laughter and joy. When Abraham in Genesis 17 heard that Sarah was going to have a child and his name was going to be what? Isaac, which means him who laughs, right? He's like, laughter. He falls on his face and laughs. Sarah, (laughs) she hears and she laughs. To herself, 25 years in the making. Verse 6 and 7 of chapter 21 says this. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Psalms 30 verse 5, what does it say? Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Isaiah 40, 54, verse 1. Sing, O barren one, who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. All this week when I was studying this, I was just like, Lord, it's got to be about laughter. I'm not saying you can't go in a different direction on the text. We could go other places. But I just kept seeing it again and again. It's just like it's laughing. It's Isaac's name. I mean, everybody who sees it's just going to be like, you're laughing. You can't help but laugh. You're either laughing or you're mocking. You don't want to be the one mocking because that's what Ishmael did. And he was kicked out along with Hagar from the house. Chapter 21, keep going a little further. Laughter, I believe, encompasses much of the Christian life. And some of it's like, well, what do you mean laughter? Well, does that mean there's no bad times? Of course there's hard times. There's a lot of hard times. But there's so much joy to be had. Think for a moment what a genuine Christian is. Just just think. And some of you right now are calculating a good definition. Good definitions are are very important. Doctrine is extremely important, but they are someone who is in disbelief that God would choose them. A genuine Christian is someone who is genuinely blown away that God would choose them, love them, die for them, call them a son or a daughter, that Jesus would be unashamed of them, that they would receive resurrection life and spend eternity with God. A Christian is someone who is absolutely just blown away that God Almighty, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who spoke it all into existence and gives me the very air in my lungs and the beat that goes in my heart that he would call him. 
Can I say it another way? No one is a Christian who thinks they deserve to be a Christian. I just need to, it's like the negative, right? No one who believes they deserve to be a Christian is a Christian. Why, how, how, do you, how do you do that? How, do you, how can you say such a dogmatic statement? Because if you think you earned it, if you think you deserve it, if you think you're righteous enough, you do not understand the gospel. You've missed the gospel. You've missed the cross. You've seen it from a distance, but you're still at Mount Sinai. You're still looking at the law, and you're dying by the letter of the law. It is only by the grace of Jesus Christ, his blood and his blood alone, that atones for our sin and gives us life. The self-righteous will never be made righteous. Unless they repent. Unless they repent. Unless in faith they believe. You will always be the prodigal son's older brother. You will always be the one with the head held high, with the chest being pounded. You'll always be the Pharisee in Luke 18. You'll never be the tax collector who wouldn't even look up to heaven, who just cries out to God and says, I'm unworthy. While the, tax, or while the Pharisee says, look at me. Look what I've done. Look how I live my life. This is what I think about when I think of this laughter. And as Trent comes up, this is something just joy inexpressible is what we have as believers. You can't help but just laugh. I mean, when was the last time you laughed at the fact that God saved you? Not that you're like, ha, 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 he saved me. No, 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 I'm saying like, what in the world? Not even like, what in the world? Maybe what in the world was he thinking? First Peter 1, 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. That's what a true Christian does. That's what a true Christian is. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with, here, joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls receiving the fullness of the promise made and one day being consummated so that even in the mix of your current joy and tears one day it will be consummate gladness and joy and pleasures forevermore at the right hand of God like Sarah laughed we as followers of Jesus Christ, we laugh also. Even in the midst of difficulty, we have joy. When was the last time you looked back and remembered what God has done for you? When was the last time you looked back and said, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be. The same God who saved me where I was is the same God who's going to bring the work of salvation to completion at the day of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's stand. May our hearts be prepared as we close with this last song. Father, we express our love and gratitude towards you this morning. Father, I pray that if there be anyone who needs prayer or would just simply like to pray or pray on behalf of someone, may that be done this morning, whether it's where they are or just with one of the prayer team members or up here at the steps and Lord just to enjoy this moment Father may we be people as we do with the Lord's Supper each week as we look back to what has been done and look forward to what is yet still ahead may we be the most joyful people in all the earth it is in Jesus we pray